You see, sometimes it is good for us to engage in the kind of thing we just engage in because it's very easy to assume that we understand what worship is and the expectations required for you to be a true worshiper because you associate yourself with Christian circles, Christian activities, and Christian experiences. But many times, if you attempt in your own private place of prayer to engage in the act of worship itself without a crowd, you will now truly discover uh, what your true state is as relates to the matters of worship. You know, around, the, around Christian circles, worship has been reduced, if you will, to singing, dancing, music. But you see, worship is not singing. Worship is not music. Worship is not dancing. You can use music to worship. You can sing as you worship. You can dance as you worship. But beyond all of that, worship goes deeper than the activities that we ascribe it to in Christian space. You need to understand that your worship is not just when you begin to speak words. Worship revolves around how you live your life on a daily basis. Worship has to do with matters of attention, matters of affection, matters of loyalty. Those are the things that define worship. If God cannot command your attention on a daily basis, if God cannot command the attention of your time, if God cannot command the attention of your finances, then anything you say out of your mouth that looks like you are worshipping is actually a false presentation of your true state. The true state of a man or woman's worship is in the things that grab your attention on a daily basis. It's in the things that command your affection on a daily basis. It's the things that command your loyalty. Once we can x-ray these three indices, we can conclude who your God is. Because your God will draw your attention. Your God will command your loyalty. And in your loyalty, <clears throat> your God will reveal your affection. So, most of the time when we say, okay, let's come for worship meetings, what people have in their minds is that we are coming to sing and to dance to God. So people think that they can live anyhow they want to live on a daily basis and just come to sing songs to God and then God will be worshipped. But you see, Jesus told us that those that will worship the Father must be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. There is no falsehood that would surround your life if indeed you will bring accurate worship to God. And the Bible tells us that worship has a characteristic. It says acceptable worship. So that means that it is possible to carry out an activity you call worship and yet it will not be accepted. So it's good from time to time that you stay with the Lord and see if you can spend 10 hours in the Lord's presence. And you didn't come to ask for anything. You didn't come to do intercession. You just came to what? Worship. And you will find that that activity will be very hard. Or the level of difficulty, whether it is hard or easy, simple or difficult, will be based on how you live your life practically on a daily basis. It will come easy and natural to those who their lives have already become a sacrifice of worship. But if your worship has been reduced to singing and dancing in a church service, and you feel that your attention, your affection, and your loyalty can be committed to anything other than God, and you attempt to do that thing for 10 hours, you will run out of what to say in 15 minutes. There will be nothing left. When you see all the ones that you know in Sunday school, the Lord is my shepherd, the, the I shall not want. The Lord is my shield and my buckler. When you have run out of all the terms, 
that other people discovered about God, you will now find out that you do not have anything secret with God that can draw songs of praise from your own heart. Sure you know that all the names that we call God came out of people's personal experiences with God. So when you are saying the Lord is my shepherd, it's not your revelation. You are singing or you are saying David's revelation of God. Is David's revelation of God accurate? Yes. But for you to have the experience that David had when he called the Lord his shepherd, then you must have discovered God at the same level that David discovered him in his personal journey. And it's good that I'm even starting there because the scripture I want to read today, I don't know why, but every time I tried to engage God concerning this meeting, he kept saying to me that before you begin to talk about restoring the waste places, you need to first understand how places become waste. How do places get into that nomenclature? How do they become that caricature whereby restoration now becomes required? And the scripture he gave me is a long read, but thank God we have enough time. We'll do Bible study, then we will pray. He gave me Leviticus 18. And the way Leviticus 18 begins, just open to Leviticus 18, verse 1. You will see the way it begins. Leviticus. Strange scripture. People have tried to read Leviticus many times, and they've run away. But that's where my teaching is from. Leviticus chapter 18 and verse... One, see the way it begins. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them, I am the Lord your God. Say unto them, I am the Lord your God. Media, if you have New King James, that's my favorite translation. My preferred, not favorite, preferred translation. I like it simple. Good. Go to verse 3. According to the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwelt, you shall not do. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan where I am bringing you, you shall not do. Nor shall you walk in their ordinances. So God brings Israel out of Egypt. And the first thing he begins to talk about is a matter of worship. These matters you are seeing that the Lord is talking about here are matters of worship. He says, Moses, go and tell them, the land I am bringing them out of, they are not to engage in the things that were engaged in in Egypt. And even the land that I am taking them to, they are not permitted to do the things that are done in Canaan. He says, you shall, nor shall you walk in their ordinances, their laws, their systems of worship, their systems of living. You shall not walk in their ordinances. Next verse, verse 4. You shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them Why? I am the Lord your God. So the matter here. It's like God was asking a simple question. Who is your God? God was saying to them that if I'm going to do anything serious with your life, the matter of whom you pledge allegiance, where your attention, where your affection, and where your loyalty lies is paramount. Because it is possible, the way the visible realm is designed, it is possible that you can suffer from a spiritual disease that is called a worship disorder. Why is it called a worship disorder? It's a worship disorder because by design, God designed that man should worship him. Human beings in the visible realm are obligated One to give the most God. popular gods that mortals worship is themselves. So the way the realm is designed, you can make a god out of yourself. If man is not worshipping himself, man is worshipping his desires. These are the two popular gods that exist in the realm of the visible. So God was saying, now that you, you want to do serious business with me, go and tell them 
that part of what I am doing in bringing you out of Egypt, bringing you out of Egypt is not so I can show the world that I have power. Do you know that God could have left Israel in Egypt? He was not under any pressure. He responded to deliver Israel out of Egypt because they cried unto him and he remembered his covenant with Abraham. He could have left them there. After all, he said they will, they will be there for 400 years. At the time he brought them out, they had been there for 430 years. Is it that God forgot? Is it that God didn't have a timetable that he was following? He could have left them there. But he brought them out, and the minute he brought them out, he needed to show them that, listen, I'm not bringing you out. My priority of bringing you out of Egypt is not to give you comfort. I know that I'm taking you to the land of milk and honey. I know that I'm taking you to a place of freedom. Because when they were in Egypt, their biggest problem was slavery. So when they cried to God, the Bible says they were crying because of their taskmasters. So that means, you know, you know when you read the scripture, you need to be able to read between the lines. That means that if the taskmasters were not suffering them, eh, Israel would have been comfortable in Egypt. And you know that's what some people are preaching now. There's something called the Goshen system and things. In fact, I saw one, one major prophet, he was talking about the Goshen system and he was telling people to come and pay about some thousands of US dollars so that I can teach them how to build the Goshen system. As beautiful as the Goshen system was, that Israel was suffering, I mean that Egypt was suffering plagues and suffering all kinds of things and Israel was safe, safe, safe in Goshen. Goshen was not God's agenda. Jo Goshen was just an arrangement by God for them to survive his judgment. They were in Egypt like that because of judgment. They were fulfilling their prison sentence. But God just made the prison sentence comfortable by giving them Goshen. It's like when Joseph went into prison and the Bible says that because the Lord was with him, the jailer now made him the head of all the prisoners. He was a glorified prisoner. It doesn't change the fact that he was in prison. So if you are celebrating Goshen, you are just celebrating being a glorified prisoner. The end game is not Goshen. One day I decided to look at what Goshen meant. Do you know that what it means? It just means close to. It was what God used to keep them close to where he wanted to take them. But Goshen was not the end game in the heart of God. So when he brought them out, he needed to re-engineer their mind. Because you see, People think that the major reason God saves us from sin is to bless us. The, so the way we measure whether a Christian is doing well or not is that we look at his worldly goods. We check the bank account. We check his clothes. Oh, since he graduated, has he gotten a job? So even some, in some Christian circles, when they want to make somebody a minister, they don't check his private life with God. They check things like, is he a faithful, tight payer? They check whether he has a car. They check whether he's packaged, because now everybody knows that the target population for the next move of God is the youth. So can he attract young people? Does, is he woke? I heard my brother leading prayers, and he was talking about a generation that is woke. Is he woke? Is he yopi enough? To bring the target population. Nobody checks to see whether he has what it takes with God to deliver the agenda of God to a generation. The priority on the heart of God is not your comfort. You may not like me, but it's true. Eh? And if you truly study the Bible carefully, you will find out that that is the truth about the scripture. The priority on the heart of God is worship. Who is your God? You see, because you will never be qualified to restore waste places. And just stay with me. I just trust the Holy Spirit for help. You will never qualify if they bring you to measure you and your attention measurement for God is not 100%. It means that if God takes you into battle, there will be things that can distract you from the war. If your eyes are not totally fixed on Jesus, 
eh? and he takes you to battle, you'll be distracted. Because when the battle becomes intense and the heat of the battle is intense, Satan knows that you have a prize in the market that he can use to turn your eyes away from the war. If your affection is not 100%, you will not know that it is patriotism to die in the Lord's service. It is out of love. You love him more than you love your life. I was telling them in Anambra last night that, you see, just read Luke chapter 14, verse 26, and you'll be shocked because many people don't read Jesus. They read Paul, they read all the letters, read all the epistles, but you ask the average Christian, what did Jesus teach? He doesn't know. 